The year is 1776 and the British East India Company is ruling India with an iron fist. In an era marked by colonial rule and suppression, the birth of the press in India was far from smooth. The British East India Company, the colonial power at the helm, was particularly wary of any medium that could potentially challenge their stronghold. So, when attempts were made to kickstart a newspaper in India, the company swiftly moved to thwart them, intent on keeping a firm grip on the narrative. Fast forward to 1780, and we find a tenacious Irishman, James Augustus Hickey, on the scene. Undeterred by the colonial power's repressive measures, Hickey launched the Bengal Gazette. This wasn't just a newspaper. It was the first spark of press freedom in India. Yet the company was not about to let this fire spread. Hickey faced a barrage of obstacles in operating his newspaper. The colonial rulers denied him postal services, a crucial element for any newspaper of the time to reach its readers. But it didn't stop there. Hickey's daring venture was met with fierce resistance. He was slapped with fines, thrown into prison, and even had his printing press confiscated. These oppressive measures led to the eventual shutdown of the Bengal Gazette, silencing the voice that had dared to speak against the company's rule. Yet, the story of James Augustus Hickey and the Bengal Gazette was more than just the tale of a suppressed newspaper. It was a testament to the spirit of press freedom that refused to be quashed. It was a beacon that illuminated the path for future journalists and newspapers in India, inspiring them to brave challenges and voice their truths. But, as we'll soon discover, the journey was far from over. The company's repressive measures were just beginning as the press found itself under increasing scrutiny. The struggle for press freedom in colonial India was a long and arduous one marked by battles fought both in the open and in the shadows. By 1795, the press in India was under the watchful eyes of the company. The Madras Gazette, a prominent newspaper of the time, found itself ensnared in the tightening net of government interference. The paper was required to submit all general orders for security checks before they could be published a move that, in hindsight, was a clear attempt to curb the paper's freedom and control the narrative. But the interference didn't stop there. The company went a step further, withdrawing the free postage facilities that the Gazette had been privy to. This move was not just an inconvenience, it was a strategic blow, making it more difficult and costly for the paper to reach its readership and stifling the spread of information. In 1798, the interference took a more personal turn. Dr. Charles McLean, an outspoken critic of the government and a respected figure in the journalistic community, found himself on the wrong side of the authorities. His crime? He had dared to criticize a magistrate in one of his articles. The company's response was swift and severe. They deported Dr. McLean, sending a chilling message to journalists throughout the colony. Step out of line and you will face the consequences. This was not just an attack on Dr. McLean. It was a blatant threat to the press, a warning that dissent would not be tolerated. The government's interference in the press was a clear violation of the freedom of speech and expression, but it was also a reflection of the broader political climate of the time. The British East India Company was not just a trading entity, it was a political power wielding its influence to control the narrative and suppress any opposition. As we move into the 19th century, the company's grip tightens further. The press, once a beacon of free speech and a platform for dissent, found itself increasingly muzzled, its voice stifled under the weight of government interference. The stage was set for a new chapter in the struggle for press freedom in colonial India. The dawn of the 19th century brought with it stricter regulations for the press. The British East India Company, under the rule of Lord Wellesley, began to tighten its grip on the press in India, introducing a series of regulations that would drastically limit the scope of journalistic freedom. In 1799, Lord Wellesley enacted a policy that required newspapers to declare their printer, editor, 
and proprietor, effectively holding them publicly accountable for the content they published. On top of this, newspapers were now required to submit their material for scrutiny before publication. This wasn't merely a check for grammatical errors or typos. This was a thorough examination of the content with the aim of suppressing any information or viewpoints that could challenge or undermine the authority of the company. But the restrictions didn't stop there. Lord Wellesley went a step further, prohibiting newspapers from publishing on Sundays. This was a clear move to disrupt the regular flow of information and to control the narrative. And the punishment for breaching these restrictions? Deportation. Two years later, in 1801, the regulations tightened even further. Now, newspapers had to submit proof sheets for examination before they could even think about going to print. It was essentially a preemptive strike against any form of dissent or criticism with the authorities holding the power to quash any content before it even reached the public. During the Second Maratha War in 1804, the press faced additional restrictions prohibiting the publication of certain military information. And in 1807, public meetings were banned by order of the governor in council, further stifling the free exchange of ideas and opinions. These measures, introduced over the span of less than a decade, represented a systematic erosion of press freedom. The press was heavily shackled, but the human spirit is hard to quell. Despite these harsh conditions, journalists and publishers continued to find ways to voice their opinions and share information, setting the stage for the rise of the underground press in the years to come. In response to the repressive measures, the press found new ways to voice dissent. As the colonial rule tightened its grip, the press turned to covert operations. The underground press emerged as a beacon of resistance, an unsung hero of the time. Fueled by the indomitable spirit of free speech, these unregulated publications and pamphlets started to circulate, often carrying sharp criticisms of the government's actions. These weren't just pieces of paper. They were whispers of rebellion, echoes of dissent, hidden in the corners of the society. They were the voices that refused to be silenced, the stories that refused to be untold. They were the sparks that kept the flame of resistance alive. This was not just about criticizing the government. It was about asserting the right to speak, to question, to challenge. It was about reclaiming the narrative. This was a silent rebellion, but the company was not one to back down. As the press rose, so did the company's desire to control it. With the dawn of the 19th century, the British East India Company sought to wield a more formalized control over the press in India. The year 1823 saw the introduction of John Adams' Press Ordinance, a legislative measure that demanded all printed matter except specific commercial information to be licensed by the Governor-General in Council. This move was aimed at ensuring that the company had an iron grip on what could and couldn't be published, effectively limiting the freedom of the press. However, the company's desire to control the narrative didn't stop there. The Indian Rebellion of 1857, a major uprising against the company's rule, led to the introduction of another significant piece of legislation. Lord Canning, then Governor-General, brought forth the Licensing Act of 1857. This act sought to regulate printing presses and curtail the tone of printed matter, particularly during the tumultuous period of the rebellion. The law was specifically designed to prevent the press from publishing content that could potentially incite further unrest or challenge the company's authority. These legislations, while ostensibly aimed at maintaining peace and order, were in reality tools to suppress the freedom of the press. They allowed the company to control the narrative, to dictate what news was fit to print, and to stifle any criticism or dissent. The press, which should have been a beacon of truth and information, was effectively muzzled and forced to toe the line set by the company. But here's the thing about the press. It is resilient. It is tenacious. 
and it is stubbornly dedicated to the pursuit of truth. Despite the harsh measures imposed by the company, the press in India found ways to continue its work, to bring news and information to the people, and to challenge the status quo. The spirit of journalism, the desire to inform and enlighten, could not be quashed by the heavy hand of colonial rule. Despite these harsh measures, the press would not be silenced. The company's press measures were met with fierce criticism. This was particularly true for Lord Canning, who faced considerable backlash for his press measures. However, his response was not to suppress the voices of dissent, but rather to engage with them directly. He established an editor's room, a forum where editors could voice their concerns and engage in a dialogue with the government. This move did much to restore public confidence in the press. In 1860, after assuming his role as the first Viceroy of India, Lord Canning proposed a significant change. He suggested omitting the charge of sedition from the Indian Penal Code, a move intended to avoid the perception of an attack on the press. However, despite this initial suggestion, sedition was later reintroduced into the Penal Code. These measures reflect a systematic suppression of press freedom, a testament to the broader colonial control over information dissemination in India.